All right, so welcome again. My name's Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and this is our first venture in this um, longest running national webinar series on forest and woodlot management. It started in May of 2007, if you can believe that. Some of you have been around for that entire time. Uh, we've switched to a new interface. Uh, the software that we're using today is, is a WebEx software. It's operated through Cisco Corporation. That's not a plug, that's just informational. Um, and uh, the, the, we spent a few minutes acclimating people to this new interface. Hopefully they're comfortable with the way that's working out. Today's webinar is uh, on stressors of trees. And my apologies for misspelling stressors. I'll have to change that for the, this evening's webinar. We're looking at this from a perspective of forest management, uh, from health and productivity. This is not going to be, I mean, you could imagine that this would go, could go, and it's not going to, it should, I shouldn't say it's would, but it, it could go into a direction of getting a lot into tree physiology, and that's not where I want to take this. This is more from a, a practical applications perspective. Uh, knowing that trees deal with stress, and you all know that trees deal with stress if you've spent any time with them. So just kind of making the best of, of uh, what can sometimes be a bad situation. Okay, so you should be able to see um, the outline slide, can folks see the outline slide? All right, good, good, thank you. Um, so I won't, I won't do that for every slide. I just wanted to make sure it was working here. So we'll, we'll go through four different things, and I've, I've kind of given these uh, quirky titles to this outline. We'll talk first about definitions and targets, and then I've thought about stresses as largely as events. Um, and this presentation was triggered after there was, you know, that we had an ice storm and we've had insect outbreaks, and so there are discrete, often large-scale episodic events. And so this was structured around the context of these large events. But the principles, I think, are going to apply even if you look at low-level, chronic, um, long-duration events. But we're, I've broken this out in terms of a of a preventative posture, so building, uh, as some authors that we'll see in just a minute have talked about building resilience into the forest. We'll look at uh, what I've called during the storm. So as the event is happening, what should you be doing as, a, as an owner and, an, and as a manager, or what could you be doing? Um, some uh, of these authors will, will talk about this as um, resilient, so dealing with the immediate impacts and then and then response or when the dust is settling, how do you um, how do you manage that? So okay, so let's start off if we're going to talk about stress, let's start off by talking about what makes for a healthy tree. Um, Healthy trees have to be able to access and utilize sunlight. So if you can't access, if the tree can't access it and utilize it, then its then its health at some level is compromised. And we could uh, appropriately argue that you know there's there's a gradient here, and the trees that are in the lower canopy, um, you know, to say that they're not healthy might be uh, pushing that definition a little too far. I do think we could say that they're stressed, and so if we see stress versus health as a as a binary condition, um, then 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 we're able to make that argument. Uh, healthy trees are going to have a functional root system, and this is. Uh, I think from, well, I, I'm not thinking, I'm certain following the ice storm in 1998 was the biggest learning event for me was the, the vital importance of having a healthy root system uh, for the tree and that trees could look healthy uh, with a damaged root system, but then when there is a secondary stress that, that affects a different part of the tree, particularly the crown, you lose those two major systems, the tree has um, some very severe problems problems. Um, and related to that is you're looking for a balance of roots and shoots or roots and foliage. And a lot of times, and we'll show some, I'll show some pictures here in just a few minutes, a lot of times as that um, 
as as trees have stresses, the way they they illustrate that they're under stress is by dieback. That's often not damage to the crown per se, but it's a it's a problem of imbalance between the roots and the shoots. Uh, healthy trees need to be able to use the energy that they produce through photosynthesis, um, the starches and the sugars, and apply that to growth. This is going to uh, result in productivity. It makes the trees bigger. It makes them flower. It makes for better flowering and fruiting production. And uh, in contrast, that energy is used uh, to, to build defense mechanisms or to heal wounds. So that's, that would take away from that health. The tree is going to be largely unaffected by disease. A little bit of disease, and we'll give some examples uh, later, are not necessarily going to be uh, problematic and may not have a measurable effect on the tree, um, but uh, we're, we're looking here at kind of building an ideal definition. Uh, and then functional flowering and fruiting. So any of the normal processes of the tree need to be functional, operational, knowing that there are, particularly, for example, with flowering and fruiting, that there's an, an internal cycle that the trees go through and that every year is not a good flowering and fruiting year, and that, and that there's a lot that happens environmentally after the flowers are formed, even after the flower buds are formed, that may not allow for a fruit to develop. So um, the absence of fruiting doesn't necessarily, the meat means, does not mean that the tree is not healthy. There may be something secondary to the tree that's causing a problem. So uh, with that is, is uh, what we'll use as a benchmark, and, and I recognize, you know, there's, um, I don't know if I've ever seen a definition, textbook definition of a healthy tree, but that's when I think about a healthy tree, that's what I think about. So, and feel free if you had other perspectives to share those in that chat pod. Contrasting then health, let's look at stress. And stress is any condition or agent, those are stressors um, that reduce the normal functioning ability, that functional capacity of the tree um, to be productive, so that that productive capacity is decreased. And our goal ultimately is to try to manage stress to the extent that we can or manage the tree's response to stress so that we can have good tree health and good productivity. So what makes when what makes a tree healthy? We've talked to this, about this a little bit. Uh, the two big components uh, to maintain growth for a healthy tree are to have a vigorous crown and to have a vigorous root system. Um, we want to be, we want to be uh, reducing uh, injury because and, and that's all kinds of injury, biological injuries, biotic injuries, environmental injuries, things like that. Uh, because when the tree is injured, it's going to uh, it's going to allocate some of its um, uh, reserves, food reserves, to uh, to do repairs, um, and it's not those that growth and that energy is not going to be available for growth. That also those injury provide points. Uh, physical injuries are going to provide points of infection uh, for microorganisms, and then the tree is going to have defense mechanisms to respond to that. Um, the reality is is that stress happens, okay? And this is the picture that you see is in northern New York um, uh, following the ice storm of 1998. The person that you see is, I think, is Dr. Mannion. Some of you in New York that uh, may be familiar with Dr. Mannion, he was a forest pathologist at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and there's a tour. Uh, Doug Allen, as I recall, was there, and Ed White, and uh, there's a, a tour following the ice storm, foresters and landowners and maple producers looking at the aftermath, and this is some of what we were seeing. Um, fortunately, ice storms of this magnitude don't happen every year, uh, but as I recall, uh, big ice storms happen, if you look at the literature, happen in the northeast somewhere on average about once every seven years. So stress happens, sometimes they're big events, sometimes they're small events. We'll talk about um, classification of stress here in just a few minutes, but it's going to happen. 
And when that stress happens, it's going to reduce the productivity of the tree. In some cases, it's going to kill the tree immediately or shortens its lifespan. And ultimately, from an owner's perspective and a manager's perspective, the foresters and loggers who are working with owners, uh, it requires extra work because you're trying to solve a problem that you previously didn't have to solve. So there's, there's good reason to want to try to reduce the impact and our exposure to stress. And our, our goals are uh, multifold. Um, we want to prevent stress. These stressors uh, interact, so the fewer of those stressors that we can, um, uh, we can be ex the trees can be exposed to at any one point in time uh, is, is to our benefit and their benefit. Um, we want to be able to, and, and that's because, you know, and ideally we're going to prevent all of the stresses. Um, it's, and it's easier, and we can't do that, of course, but um, it's easier to prevent a problem oftentimes than to solve a problem. If we can anticipate and predict um, stresses, that allows us uh, the potential to reduce the impact of the stress. We may be able to minimize the negative interactions that would occur with other stresses and uh, where appropriate and necessary compensate for other kinds of um, desired outputs. So um, if, if we know that, if we can anticipate, and you can see in the picture Steve Childs, our New York State maple specialist, is doing an uh, inventory of, on uh, sugar maple twigs for forest and caterpillar. Uh, if you anticipate an outbreak, you can, you can uh, either try to thwart that outbreak or thwart that problem or compensate for that. Uh, if you understand the injury, um, the owner and the manager can gauge the extent of the response. So if the injury, and, and, and particularly knowing the source, whether it's acute or um, kind of widespread, if it's chronic, if it's natural, all of the characteristics that make up that stress, knowing that is going to allow uh, owners and managers to, to formulate the best possible res response. There are some stresses that we can manage. I mentioned this earlier. There are others that, that are completely out of our control. Uh, typically, the human-induced uh, stresses, we have some ability to control. Um, and, it, and it may be that we're not really managing the stress, but we're managing either the tree's response to the stress or we're managing our ability to acquire what we needed from those trees. And a good example of that is uh, with maple producers. They may anticipate a forest tent caterpillar outbreak. They have the, if they do that in advance, they have the option of, of deciding whether or not they want to spray their sugar bush um, and, and, and preparing for that in a timely fashion because there's a fairly narrow window of opportunity to spray, uh, at least with Bacillus thuringiensis, or that if they're not going to spray, or if they, you know, for whatever reason don't have that as an option, they might decide that they're going to reduce their tapping intensity and uh, purchase bulk syrup so that they're still able to satisfy their markets, um, but then they're managing the stress in that way. And so then they're the metric of managing for stresses that we're wanting to have healthy trees, but we're not wanting to compromise our, our market share. Um, and then finally, being, uh, being able to minimize the impact, as, as, as I just described. There are other authors, and, and I'll make reference to this uh, book in just a minute, that uh, was edited by Swanston and J uh, Janowick, Janowick, excuse me, uh, just this year. Uh, that's from the perspective of forest response to climate change, but they look at this, this set of goals in a context of resistance and resilience and response. So building resistance in the forest, um, taking advantage of resilience so the trees are impacted by the stress, but they're able to withstand the stress, and then response. So after you have that stress, how do you manage that? I'll show you that uh, book in just a minute and also uh, allow you, I've got it, we'll, we'll show you another little tool here of the, of the software so you can download that if you want right from this website. Okay, so if, as we think about how do we manage stress, we've talked about 
dealing, and I, when I say manage stress, recognize I'm talking about managing either the stress or or the way the trees respond to that stressor. The tool that we have is silviculture. Um, defining that, breaking it out, Sylvia is tree, this is Latin. Um, culture is to manage or manipulate, so adding those together as a definition uh, allows for the art and science of controlling the establishment, composition, growth, and quality. So that's where we're getting into some of these health issues of a forest stand to meet the objectives of ownership. So with silviculture, we're manipulating the forest. Uh, this is going to be particularly important uh, in building uh, resilient um, resistance of the forest to stresses as well as responding to those stresses. So these are organized and deliberate activities um, that we can use as a tool to um, avoid avoid the, the magnitude or the presence of the stresses and then the response of the forest to those stresses. Stress, as we've mentioned, is a normal part of forest growth and development, uh, but what we want to do is reduce the impacts that it has. We use silviculture as a tool. We're not going to get heavily into silviculture. Um, those of their several foresters who are here will understand that, and, and forest owners, hopefully, are working with a forester and can have that conversation. So what is a stress tree? We mentioned this. We've talked about um, characteristics of the stress tree. It's going to be struggling to acquire the resources that it needs. Um, it's going to be devoting some of those resources towards um, repairing tissues, for example, that may have been damaged, um, or maybe needing to allocate some of those energy reserves towards controlling infection and decay. The picture you see, uh, the crowns of some sugar maple trees, this is the, the primary crown we're looking at, but back here in the corner you see some more dieback on the tips of these trees. This is an area that uh, on one of the Cornell properties that was harvested. It was, uh, I'll say it was pretty close to a textbook harvest as a, as a shelter wood cut. Um, what was unfortunate, at least the, the, the stand structure manipulation was textbook. What didn't happen by textbook was um, this, this knoll that these trees were on. So these sugar maples were maybe a little bit off site, not grossly, uh, but it was followed by a drought. And then we had a late spring frost in May a couple of years ago. Um, and that late spring frost followed a couple of years of forest tent caterpillar and a little bit of gypsy moth defoliation. So we had a kind of a broad chronic predisposing stress in this slightly drought prone soil. Sugar maple is uh, uh, demanding of site conditions.
the other issue is what causes the problem isn't really the dead branches. It's the ants that uh, are competing with our forest trees and um, reducing their ability to respond to, uh, to, to acquire the resources. One of, the that to, uh, um, one of the things that I'm often dealing with personally and then also as uh, in, in my job is people say, I've got this problem, what is it? I'm not a pathologist and I'm not an entomologist. Um, Um, if you do, good. Um, uh, but others of you might find something like this and say, what is it? How do I find out the answer to that? Uh, what I recommend doing is uh, there's several different ways you can you can approach this and you know pick pick the easiest way first. Um, but you may want to explore all of these. Uh, one one option that you have to identify what your stress agent is, and this is particularly with biological organisms, is go to your land grant university. So every state has a land grant university. In New York, it's Cornell, and Vermont, it's the University of Vermont at Burlington, and Pennsylvania, it's the, uh, the Pennsylvania University University, so forth. Um, they will most of them will have a plant disease diagnostic lab. So when I did a search for Google search for Cornell uh, plant disease diagnostic lab, uh, one of the first hits I had was for the plantclinic.cornell.edu. Um, the so I've got a question here from Peter. Back one pick. What were we looking at in that log? Okay, is this what you're talking about, Peter? I assume it is. So this is the butt end of a log. This is a close-up of a um, of a log pile fall at a log landing, and this is a sugar bush that was being harvested. It was an old sugar bush, and these were some very old trees that were present when the at that time. So this would have been. Uh, and somebody maybe can correct me um, on the timing. It was in the 60s and 70s, uh, paraphenaldehyde was used as a tablet and placed into tap holes. And what that did was it prevented the growth of bacteria inside the tap hole and it allowed uh, the sap to flow longer. Um, there are two problems with that. One is paraphenaldehyde is a carcinogen and because of that has been outlawed and use in uh, certainly in, in maple production, I'm guessing in any kind of food related um, uh, connection. Uh, the other thing that it did was it, it disabled the tree's ability to compartmentalize the wounding that was associated with tapping. So when you tap a tree, you drill a hole into the tree and you're wounding it. Normally, sugar maple has a very strong capacity to compartmentalize that wound and not allow the decay organisms to spread throughout the stem. So what you're seeing is the butt end um, of a, this it looks like this pretty close to the stump end. Well, no, because it's, well, you're seeing one end of a sugar maple log. I don't know which end of it log it is. And you're seeing uh, all of those kind of that spider web or all of those were former tap holes. So this is a tree that may have been over tapped. Um, it was certainly though uh, probably used uh, paraphernalia tablets. So good question. Spiles are the, are the spouts that you put into a maple tree to collect the sap. Thank you, Herb. So um, lots of ways to go about identifying. Um, 
If you go to your land-grant university, every state will have a land-grant university. I suspect they all have some plant disease diagnostic lab. If not, you can go to the neighboring state. Uh, I know in, in New York there is a fee if you want to have something identified, and so you may want to use this as your last resort, or if, if knowing the answer is particularly important. So other ways that you can pursue is to talk to a local forester, go to your state agency forester, talk to the um, talk to your consulting forester, talk to your uh, uh, local industrial forester, take a sample with you, take a picture, send them an email, something like that. Uh, most foresters are going to be familiar with most types of problems. Uh, most states, I think all states have master gardeners, and in the Northeast at least they all have uh, programs that are similar to a master forest owner volunteers. These are both non, um, at least the master forest owner types of programs are non-technical, they're not specialists, they have some general awareness of some of the problems and, and it varies from person to person based on their own interests. So. Uh, they may be able to help identify what you're dealing with. Um, they they have connections to their local cooperative extension, which is an oversight to not list that explicitly, but the local cooperative extension educators are going to be very well versed in, in many, if not all, of the common problems that are happening. And they will know uh, because they are kind of a central point for questions if there's an outbreak of parathrips or if there's leucanium scale or if there's uh, whatever, they will know uh, what's happening in their local area. We have a website, uh, cornellforestconnect.ning.com. This is a social media site, and you can go there and you can post pictures and you can ask questions. And this is a great uh, utility of this site. If you have something you can't identify it, take a couple of high quality pictures, leave the blurry ones in the you know, on your computer trash can, send some high quality pictures to the Ning site. Uh, there are a couple hundred people that are on that and you have the option to, to pick a lot of brains in a pretty easy fashion. And then uh, finally, you may want to send an email to uh, email a picture to the state forest health specialist. So whatever the state agency is where you work, take a good picture, find out who the state forest health specialist is, uh, send them a picture. Know that you know the state forest health specialist gets a lot of, of um, inquiries and so uh, some of them will have, you know, depending upon the time of year, they may or may not be able to give a timely response. So. These are several options that you have available. So if we want to describe a stress, and, and this is the kind of thing that you'd want to think about if you're trying to identify an agent of stress, is to be able to describe it in a way that the person that you're seeking information of can help. So you may want to think about uh, being able to describe it as to its duration. Uh, oftentimes you will see something that's different and uh, it wasn't, it was there today and it wasn't there last week, so you don't really know if this is chronic or acute. Um, so that may or may not be something you can really comment on. You want to do your best to identify whether it's a biotic or an abiotic stress. Uh, is it affecting one tree or is it affecting a whole series of trees? Um, does it happen, uh, do you see it every year at a particular time? Um, did it um, so the seasonal timing and, and, and how that may vary over the course of the season. Um, is the stress agent uh, connected to anything else? Is there something else that has happened? And um, I've gotten inquiries from people that show me pictures of the crown of a tree and there's something very wrong with it, that's obvious. And then as you start asking questions, you find out, well, they just um, added blacktop to the driveway that's immediately underneath that tree. And so the heat from the blacktop and the construction equipment, um, that's what really caused the tree. So it's not the crown per se, but something happening somewhere else on the tree. So connectivity is important. And then I just referred to this in terms of the predisposition. So if you're looking at an individual tree, where is that tree relative to the rest of its world? So how dense is the stand that it's in? Is it is it an open grown tree? Is it in a, in a very dense stand? 
Um, and we'll see some examples of that. Topographic position, aspect, soils, uh, soil characteristics are all potentially uh, important predisposing. So this is your, your building a body of information here that helps you understand what that stress is and how to manage it. Um, recognize that a lot of times by the time you know that, that a stress is there, the damage has been done. And so you can't correct, you can't prevent it, you can't correct it, you have to, you have to deal with whatever has happened. Uh, but it does allow you, hopefully, to prepare for this kind of thing in the future. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's look at the, kind of the before the storm, an ounce of prevention. Um, monitoring is important, and there are lots of things that you can be uh, monitoring. Uh, essentially, you're monitoring for the potential agents of stress. So you're looking for insects, you're, make, you're keeping track of rainfall and, and being aware of drought conditions. If you have uh, logging activities, you're supervising logging to making, making sure that the loggers are, are um, operating in areas where you planned for them to operate and you're communicating effectively. Uh, you'll relocate bad or missed location, miss, mislocated um, skid trails or tractor trails, and you're looking at characteristics of the crown and of the, of the density of the stand to make sure that the trees have the opportunity to grow as much as they need to grow. So this, again, earlier we talked about, you know, kind of on the before the, the before the stress agent happens, and um, or building um, resistance to the impacts of stress. Uh, insect monitoring. Um, if you're going to be monitoring insects, we'll look at those different uh, examples here in a little bit more detail. If you're going to be monitoring for insects, you have to understand the life cycle of the insect, and that just goes without saying. The internet has, uh, I'll argue, probably more than most of us want to know about insects. If you do a Google search on forest tent caterpillars or gypsy moths or emerald ash borer or pear thrips or saddle prominent or whatever, you can find information out there. So learn and study the insect, understand its life cycle, know what, um, what aspect of that insect um, you're going to be looking for. Is it, is it uh, well, so just you have to understand the insect. Um, you know, the picture here is showing it's in a sugar bush. Um, and this was back in, I'll say, 2006 or 2007. We'd had, this was on a, one of the Cornell sugar bushes near Ithaca. And uh, we knew that there were some uh, forest tent caterpillars. We'd started to see some evidence the previous spring. So we were out that winter and we had sacrificed some lower quality trees. Uh, wanting to get, we were trying to personally learn more about this process. You don't need to, oftentimes you don't need to cut down your trees. You can use a spotting scope uh, and look for evidence of the insects. Um, but you want to know what growth forms you're looking for. In this case, we're looking for the eggs that are on the twigs. Uh, be able to uh, know what the lookalikes are so that you, if you're trying to count um, egg sacks or egg clusters, know what you're looking for, know what you're not looking for, and you can do this then to plan ahead. You know, what, what, what can I expect? Do I have enough insects that it's going to, um, uh, the population is going to, going to explode and I have a problem? Um, another very, I'll say, easy way, it takes a lot of work, but it's, it's a fairly straightforward approach to, to reduce the, the risk that your forest has for um, stress agents is to control stocking. Uh, and stocking, just as if you're talking to a, a cattle rancher, uh, stocking is the number of organisms per unit area. So we're talking about trees per acre, or basal, more specifically, basal area per acre combined with trees per acre. If your forest is overstocked, the trees are competing for resources. If they're competing for resources, they're less thrifty. Uh, the pine stand that you see on the left-hand picture, this is a plantation of red pine on one of the, on the Arnott Forest. And it was planted 
in, oh gosh, the 1930s, had never been thinned. And you can see, that, you know, these crowns are poorly formed, which you can't see because of the darkness of the screen is that there are a lot of, you know, very small stems that have already died. So um, you're, you're allocating a fixed amount of sunlight that comes in per acre, and you're allocating that across hundreds of stems. So it's not going to, um, you know, it's not necessarily doing those trees any favor if you were trying to maintain their growth and vigor. There are some organisms that are particularly um, more likely to occur when you have an overstock stand. The picture on the right is sugar maple, and it's showing a fusarium fungus. Fusarium happens where you have sugar maple growing on somewhat droughty soils in overstocked conditions. So here you see the two factors coming together, overstocking and droughty conditions. So the trees are competing. They're less able um, to resist the presence of this and grow past it, um, and so that you get trees that succumb. So controlling stocking helps with that. Um, related to that, uh, you're going to monitor tree growth. So if, if the trees are overstocked, if your stand is overstocked, the trees are going to be growing slower. Um, you can Those two will, will work together. So look at things like diameter growth. You may want to have some permanent plots. Um, this is you know, uh, a labor-intensive way to monitor for stress, but it's, it's an interesting way to keep track of that. One of the things that we do when we have our long-term growth plots, and this was an idea that I've always associated with Dr. Nyland, and um, oh, you, you put a, a nail, an aluminum nail, at about a foot off the ground, and then you take a three-and-a-half-foot stick, and then you measure at the top of that stick so that you have um, a consistent point of measurement. Um, you might also just look at things like twig elongation or tap hole closure rate. So how quickly is that tree growing as an indica indication of its, of its growth potential and its um, exposure to stress. Anytime you cut down a tree, uh, you have a chance to look at growth rings. You should look at growth rings. Uh, growth rings tell incredible stories. Uh, the faster a tree is growing, the more, um, the better able it's is to um, utilize what's called coded or the compartmentalization of decay in trees. So that's a that's a good one to look up if you haven't looked up uh, compartmentalization of decay in trees. Um, and the pathologist I just had his name on the tip of my tongue. One if somebody knows somebody here knows the name of the person that came up with coded. Um, Share that in the chat pod if you can if you if you can think of it. I, I'm close. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Art. Uh, Alex Shigo, you guys are good. I knew I could count on you. Um, so compartmentalization of decay in trees. When a tree is wounded, it, it isolates that wound and it prevents micro essentially prevents microorganisms or tries to prevent microorganisms from spreading throughout the tree. Um, using tapping guidelines, for example, is a good way. Uh, following them is a good way to uh, ensure that you reduce the the damage to the tree and that it's able to heal correctly. Uh, if the, if the trees are not growing well, they're going to stagnate. Uh, the other trees will grow taller than them, so you will get vertical stratification in the in the crown of your forest. The smaller trees are going to be more likely to die, but the bigger trees have still suffered through competition. So um, uh, maintain good diameter growth by controlling stocking. Uh, what we're what we're managing for is the amount of resources that come in, and you can you have a fixed amount of resources, as I mentioned. You can distribute those to uh, um, a little bit of those resources to many trees, or you can concentrate those resources to a few trees. Through thinning, you're making an investment of sunlight and you want to leave behind the best trees. If what you're trying to do is grow those trees, leave behind the best trees as the recipients of that inv investment. Eventually, you'll regenerate your stand, and then you can capitalize on the investment that you've made. If you have diseased or damaged stems, uh, uh, you know, work to get those out of the stand. 
Um, in some cases, some of those diseases will spread. That's typically not very common. It is with things like fusarium, things like nectria and utapella are common enough. They probably don't spread that much. Uh, eventually, though, some of those stems are going to break. You know, this is, you can imagine, a stem that in the right snow load, that stem would break. It's going to fall into another tree. In this case, it might fall into this tree that's equally unthrifty, but it's, it's more awkward and it's more unsafe to deal with uh, trees when they're tangled up in another tree. Um, the other thing that's happening is you're, you're, you're allocating sunlight and resources to a tree that's never going to amount to anything. So you've, you've uh, wasted growing space that could have been uh, perhaps given to a, to a neighboring tree uh, to better advantage. And then uh, looking at the right site, you want to make sure that um, the, the trees that you're growing are growing on the right site. Uh, you can have wonderful species, wonderful intentions, wonderful um, you know, hopes, but if the, if the tree is not matched to the soils, the tree is going to suffer. You're going to be frustrated and there's nothing you're going to do that's going to make that tree grow well. So don't, don't try to force, even though the tree may have established there, that just means, means that the seeds landed, the seed sprouted, the seedling grew, but as, as the tree gets bigger, the tree is, uh, is, is, um, challenging the ability of the root system to feed the crown. And so as the tree gets too big, that challenge is overwhelming of the tree and then you'll have a, a large scale uh, problem on your hands. So what do you do? Um, educate yourself. Uh, Ralph Nyland wrote a, a great fact sheet for the Forest Connect series and it's um, called Silviculture and Invasive Insects, and if you want to get a copy of that, you can, two different ways to do that. Uh, you can go to forestconnect.info, or if you go to the file menu in the upper left-hand corner, and let's just take uh, 30 seconds, if you want to do this, go to the file menu, go to transfer, and you should be able to open up that transfer dialog box on your computer screen and uh, download a copy of this file to your computer. Uh, Dr. Nyland wrote this uh, relative to the first three bullets. Uh, the file menu is in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. Is anybody able to do that? Okay, good. So several of you could do that. Good. If you can't get it from there, go to forestconnect.info and then look on publications. Um, some of you, so some of you are having trouble with this. It may be, I wonder if you don't have the right software to work within the system. So um, Dr. Nyland wrote this. I'm sorry for that, but there's, at this point, I'm, I'm I don't know what I can do. Um, Dr. Nyland wrote this fact sheet relative to EAB, Asian Longhorn, and Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. Uh, but it gives, gives a, a great way to kind of prepare for the onset of these uh, different um, bugs. All right, I got to talk faster. Um, find ways to educate yourself, go out in the woods, talk with foresters, learn about the things that are going on and what you need to do. Okay, so when you're in the middle of it, in the thick of it, uh, during the storm, what should you do? Your goal here is you want to understand the injury, you want to manage the stress and minimize the impact. There's four steps to take, so we'll look at each of those. First and foremost is being safe. Uh, make sure if you're going to be using a chainsaw, and this is a, a picture I took of the game of logging course, if you're going to be using a chainsaw, make sure that you have the appropriate training um, to know what you're getting into. Uh, you know, certainly in the midst of the, in the midst of the, um, of the event, you don't want to be out in the middle of it, right? There's no, there's no gain in that. So uh, you're not in the middle of it. This is, you know, the next day or the next week or six months later, you're out. You have trees that are, you know, sideways or you have 
uh, 40 dead stems per acre and you have lots of hazards and snags, uh, whatever it is, uh, when, when you're working with this, um, be safe. Okay, so Art shared a study. I'm going to see if I can copy this art and then repaste it so people can see it. So here are a couple of studies. I just put them up in the chat pod. Um, and I don't have immediate links to those. One is by Mannion and Paul Mannion and Griffin, a healthy amount of tree death. Um, and then um, Forest Health by John Castello and Teal in 2011. Huh, okay. So be safe. During the storm, be safe is your first priority. Don't, you know, don't, it's not worth dying for trees. You have to know what the stress is, be able to understand it, describe it using the terms that we had before. And each of these, I give some example, each of these have uh, different characteristics of the stress. Know what that stress is because you want to be able to avoid the interaction of those stressors. So don't add insult to injury. So if you have one type of stress, think about how some other activity or some other predisposing condition is going to overlap and cause you additional grief. So understand the, the context of the forest that you're working in, the stress that you're experiencing, and then what's going to happen next that either you want to prevent or not prevent. Um, what you don't want is to have interaction of stressors. Uh, those, those interacting stresses have, um, have big implications for trees. Trees can often handle a single stress. Double stresses are problematic. Triple stresses are really problematic. Okay, uh, so this is about, for, for maple producers, um, there are you know, conservative uh, ways that you can go about tapping and under some circumstances you want to avoid tapping altogether. I think I'm going to skim across this because I'm running, running short on time. If we want to minimize the impact, um, I mentioned this, we want to reduce the number of stress events so that we can reduce the likelihood of um, interaction of those stresses. Uh, maybe that as an example that you want to delay harvesting at least for uh, a period of time, maybe a full growing season if you had uh, very severe stress. Um, thinning in and of itself can have some thinning shock on trees. We've seen this in, in sugar bushes where we've done very conservative thinning, thinning from below and tree growth rates um, and sugar concentrations decline for the first couple of years. Um, it may be that you want to, uh, as another example, synchronize your harvesting to take advantage of the life cycle of insects. Uh, for example, with forest tent caterpillar, you wouldn't want to be harvesting um, after the insects have come out, um, but before they've laid their eggs, because then those egg masses are going to be concentrated on the residual trees. Instead, if you can delay the harvesting by a few weeks, you allow the eggs to be laid, and then whatever trees that you harvest, you're removing those eggs from the forest stand. Okay, and Peter offers um, uh, the source for Mannion's article. Thank you, Peter. All right, so after the, the dust is settled in the aftermath, we're trying to understand the injury, minimize the impact, and then I'll say also we want to prevent this from happening in the future. So we talked about education. We want to monitor the way the trees are recovering. Uh, don't complicate the stress, and I say that in the context of uh, interacting stress events. Consider all of your options and what those next steps are. Um, and, and as a landowner or working with landowners, reevaluate what your objectives are. Uh, depending upon the extent of the, depending upon the extent of the of the injury, the um, you may want to your your objectives may some of your objectives may no, no longer be accessible. So what you're going to do depends upon the owner, what the owner has the capacity to do, what the owner has the ability to do, the willingness to do, and the interest to do. So all these things need to, it's a, the, the solution is oftentimes quite complex. The more complicated and expansive the stress event, 
um, the more uh, 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 the more creative you're going to need to be with finding solutions that work. So um, what's interesting is that, or interesting and or useful, is that there's a fair amount of work that's that's being made available. Um, uh, to deal with climate change and climate change tools. This is, I mentioned earlier, referenced by uh, Swanston and Maria um, Genoyak. I'm probably mispronouncing that. She's, she's been a webinar presenter, and I apologize for, for mispronouncing her name. Um, but they have a, a fairly substantial bulletin that came from the U.S. Forest Service Northern Research Station just this year. It's called Forest Adaptation Resources. Uh, climate change tools and approaches. I'm going to open up. This is the file transfer box. So you should be able to see that on the screen. And you'll see the file name, uh, Forest Adaptation. If you click on that, I'm assuming folks can do this. Um, and then they can uh, download, should be able to click on the download option. So. All right, I'm going to just minimize that, and you can uh, go to the, in the upper left-hand corner to that file, and I'll bring up that, that tab here in just a minute. So they talk about um, management strategies relative to climate change. Those have very good um, application to management strategies for trees under stress because we're essentially dealing with situations that would that would be described similarly. And they, they have a, a series of kind of summary steps to prioritize. So under stress, it's going to be important to prioritize your actions so that first you're able to achieve the most critical actions, management actions first, and secondly, develop a sequence of management actions that may be important. And in some situations, doing one event before another event is going to be particularly important. Um, you want to be able to uh, attentive to changes in the forest. This is for adaption, uh, changes in the forest, and changes in knowledge. Uh, some you know some things have been around for a long time. Forest tent caterpillar has been around forever. The the knowledge curve is is flattening out on some of these stress events. Other stressors, uh, stress agents, we're still learning. So be uh, open to and receptive to and seeking of knowledge as that develops. Position yourself uh, so that you can learn more. So attend workshops, go to conferences, uh, search on the internet, participate in social media, things like that. Use um, strategies that are no regret strategies. Um, and, and by this, you want to be considering those actions that will have a net positive return and particularly that have multiple potential benefits under a variety of different scenarios. So you may not really be able to predict. So you have, let's say, a drought or you have an ice storm. You may not be able to predict what's going to happen in the following year or the following five years. So, so pick those management actions that are going to have a broad range of benefits. Uh, reduce the risk by identifying uh, management actions that uh, take into account the uncertainty of different outcomes. Um, this is particularly useful when we think about preventing uh, stress agents, uh, but also as, as important after the stress has, has occurred. And I can't uh, overstate, uh, this is, I, I'll say my personal bias, but um, interactions of stresses are really big. So single stresses, again, oftentimes short duration, single stresses have minimal impact. They may look bad, but they're not really that big of a deal. And I think I'll stop there. I'm uh, two minutes over. I've only, there's only a couple more slides, and those aren't really uh, relevant to what we're, um, what we're, what we're going to go into, and I'll just call your attention. So, so let's let's do some things here first. First, let me post the exit survey because I want all of you to take that. I really hope you do, and uh, for for a couple of reasons. One, because uh, I want to know about the content of the webinar, but also if there's things that are going on with this interface, let me know. I have very limited, you know, I'm low on the totem pole uh, uh, at Cornell and, and who they ask for opinions of on these things. Um, 
but if there's anything that I can do to improve the interface or to give feedback or to learn how to use this better, um, that will be particularly important. Um, so please take that exit survey. It's there in the chat pod, and if you go to the note pod, uh, you can gain um, access to it there as well. Um, uh, the other thing I'll do is I'll put up this file transfer, move that so we can still see, I guess you can see everything there. You can download those files. Hopefully some of you were having trouble earlier downloading. Hopefully this makes it easier. Um, and then if there are questions, um, we'll, I'll be more than happy to take some of these questions. I saw one earlier from... All right, so Jake says, if thinning adds to stress, what other measures do I have? What's the least stressful season for thinning? So, um, thinning, so I, I think, to, you know, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't use thinning as a tool, um, but, but rather that recognizing that thinning can have a stress in the higher up in, I'll, I'll uh, I'll speculate. I don't know if there's science to back this up, but I think it's. I think I've seen it, and I and I'm not wouldn't be surprised by the the higher in the canopy you're removing trees from the thinning, the more likely you are for the residual trees to experience some level of stress, uh, and that's because you're taking a couple of reasons. One, the bigger trees are going to have more physical interaction, if you will, as they're coming down, and there may be um, so that's one aspect of, of thinning stress with the, the upper canopy trees. The other is that you're leaving behind trees that have uh, maybe have less uh, experience with high levels of sunlight. Now they've got higher wind exposure. Uh, their, their local environment has changed pretty profoundly. And it's... Um, uh, it, it, because of that, they're going to be more uh, susceptible to stress. Those may be environmental stresses. It may be that they had some biological organism, and um, that it's uh, you know, that environmental change in the environment gave a gave an edge to the biological agent. So they may be interacting. Um, wind, you know, Herb points out, wind is a potential problem. So, so thinning in and of itself is not something we should avoid. In fact, thinning is important. Uh, ideally, you're going to get into the stand sooner than later. And you obviously you don't have control over that many times. If you just bought the land or you got behind on things or the landowner just called you or whatever it is, you thin when you have the opportunity. The, 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 the thinning that you can do before the trees are stagnant, the before the trees really have problems, um, then, um, you know, then you're, you're going to have less of an issue. Where we have uh, worked in sugar bushes that were quite young, uh, so the average diameter on these trees was, I'll say, um, eight to ten inches and it had been thinned previously. So these trees were largely healthy and vigorous. We went in and put in some thinning research plots. There's very little um, stress response. And other sugar bushes that had never been thinned, that were of larger diameter, uh, they had fairly pronounced declines in uh, sugar sap sugar concentration for the first year or two. Okay, um, so anyway, so thin, by all means thin, it's going to, the residual trees, if you're, if you're thinning, retaining the right trees and they're healthy, I'm not, I'm not at all pointing, um, I don't, I, Jake's a common um, participant here, so I'm not, certainly not pointing to him, I'm not trying to suggest he's doing anything wrong, but so when, when you know, so thin um, and, and leaving behind, as you know, leaving behind the right trees, um, uh, in good conditions, suitable for that site, in the long run you're going to be better off. So if, if you're, for whatever reason, got in, the stand was thinned later than you would have felt it ideal, there may be some thinning shock, and that's just part of the cost of doing business. Uh, the best trees, leaving the best trees behind, they'll be able to respond. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. Okay, let me scroll back here and see where we are. 
Uh, Lou wants to know if this um, Swanston publications on Forest Connect Ning. No, it is not. Um, but if you do a Google search, use the keywords climate, NRS, and 87, you can get it from the internet. Okay, so I posted the exit survey into the chat pod that should be hot linked, and uh, you should be able to click on it. You might have to hold down your cursor to get to it. Although now it's not working for me. There it is. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So I guess that was it for questions. Wow, you guys are going easy on me. Um, and I thanks. There were. Uh, there, uh, Art Brooks, I guess, and Peter Connaughton shared some information on some other resources, some great information out there. That's part of that educational process. I'll see if I can find those before the evening webinar and, and include those. Uh, and when I do, I'll, I'll uh, include links to those at the Ning site. I, for all of these webinars now, I'm writing a blog that uh, summarizes, gives a brief, very brief summary of the webinar and provides links. All right, so here's a question. Uh, so uh, Peter noticed the root crown of the tree in the very first slide was out of the ground. Is that any indication of stress? So in that um, particular slide, I don't think it was, but it's a very good observation, and there are uh, and there's a lot of uh, Foresters have a lot more experience with this than I do, so I'll, I'll offer my thoughts um, and, and welcome input from them. Uh, the, the shape of the crown, the presence of the roots uh, can be in, indicative. There was, a, I don't know if I showed this slide or not, there was a, one slide of a, of a pine plantation that was on somewhat poorly drained soils, and the roots you could, the roots were fairly uh, prominent on the ground, suggesting that there wasn't good root penetration uh, into the soil, and that, so they're very shallow rooted. So in a case like that, the interpretation is the, um, you know, the trees are going to be more prone to wind stress. And that particular owner working with their forester decided that, um, uh, so David's got a problem with the survey. I'll come back to that in a second, David. The, the forester and the landowner decided that it wouldn't make sense to do a partial harvest. It's a fairly small area, it's about four acres, but the concern was that a partial harvest leaving behind um, the, the few best trees, and this was a pretty ratty looking pine plantation, those trees would blow over. Um, so they opted instead for a clear cut and they're looking to regenerate it using um, other fashions, either through artificial planting or natural seeding. So the, the shape of the base of the tree is relevant. Sometimes I've seen trees that have had barbed wire or have had uh, damage at the base of the tree that have quite uh, kind of a swollen, so it's above the root crown and above the roots, but in the first two feet of the stem it looks kind of swollen uh, and, then it, and then it constricts fairly obviously to the main stem, those associated with um, um, uh, those associated with some kind of damage to the butt of the tree, often indicating a hollow stem. So, uh, so yes, uh, those Peter, those uh, the, the characteristics of the butt of the tree and the root crown can give you information on that particular tree that I showed in that first slide. I don't believe that was the case. So. Okay, well, thank you all very much. This is, uh, I guess we survived our first WebEx webinar. I appreciate your patience. You were all very patient and thoughtful. And I'll look forward to having you back in 2013. I wish you all a very Merry Christmas or whatever you, the winter holiday is that you're celebrating. My best wishes to you. And uh, I'll look forward to your participation in 2013. Thanks very much. So you can now, I'm going to turn off the recording.